Hi everybody, I'm Marcel Epley, President and CEO of the Long Beach Community Foundation. It's my honor and privilege to welcome you today to our second of a three-part webinar series celebrating the Long Beach Community Foundation's 25th anniversary. This is a city that philanthropy built, celebrating the past, present, and future of charitable giving in Long Beach. Today we're going to be talking about the present and really Long Beach Community Foundation has been at the center of charitable giving for the last 25 years. And over these years, we've distributed millions of dollars in grants and scholarships that have made a positive impact on Long Beach and really throughout the United States in some cases. But we're here today specifically to highlight just how much charitable giving has impacted Long Beach. And as we look around our great city, you might not realize how many structures and landmarks provide needed services and are supported by generous donations by people from our past and our present. So today we're gonna to take a tour along with my esteemed panel here um, of notable structures in our city and tell you a little bit more about how they came to be and, uh, and how they're still around today. This is a one hour uh, webinar and we're gonna take some time at the end for the Q&A, so please use the Q&A feature uh, uh, below and uh, also uh, get into the chat. We would love to hear from you. This is recorded and uh, it will be emailed to all who registered, so we hope that you share it with friends. Before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to open up the chat and invite you to share your favorite Long Beach iconic structures and buildings. What stands out to you? Maybe it's the Aquarium of the Pacific or their new building, the Pacific Visions Editions. Uh, maybe it's the iconic Walter Pyramid on Cal State Long Beach campus. Mike and Arlene Walter are founders of our foundation and have been very generous there as, one, as well as thousands of other generous donors uh, to that campus and the pyramid. Uh, and there's so many iconic structures. I, I just wanna make it really clear um, in Long Beach, we're really just talking about just a handful today for now. So, so uh, help us by going in the chat and tell us a little bit more about iconic structures in Long Beach that are very notable to you. Uh, maybe you're a board member on a foundation that works there, or maybe you are um, somebody who donates to that structure. We wanna hear about it. And so we'll be looking at the chat. I already see Villa Riviera, Rancho Los Cerritos. Awesome, we're gonna be talking about that with Julie today. So first, we're gonna talk uh, with Rich Archibald. And um, his news career dates back to being a paper boy uh, delivering Chicago dailies on his bicycle. From there, his newsy star rose and he left his managing editor position at the Miami Herald before transplanting in Long Beach to take the managing editor position at the Press-Telegram in 1978. Under Archibald's leadership, the Press-Telegram has won many significant awards and Rich himself was inducted into the University of Illinois Media Hall of Fame in September of 2007. He continues to serve as the Press-Telegram's public editor and columnist. There's a Long Beach rumor that he has ink in his veins and I actually witnessed that when I worked with him at the Press-Telegram, so it's not really rumor, it's true. I know Rich um, is, really to know Rich is to know that he is a die-hard Chicago Cubs fan. And he and his wife, Pat, absolutely adore their grandchildren, Carmen, Wheatseal, and Elena. So Rich, we are happy to have you here today, and you're going to really uh, take us down a path to learn about iconic Long Beach structures. Great. Thank you, Marcel. And I do really do have ink in my veins. If you want to check, I can see it from check here. that later. Mm -hmm. And the Cubs are in town to play the Dodgers, so we'll beat them again, too. Oh, Dodgers. What I want to talk about is Long Beach, uh, my adopted city, which I've grown to love. Uh, as Marcel says, I came here in 1978. And the first thing Larry Allison did was take me on a tour of the city. And he showed me all these, these great places, a lot of historical etc cetera, etc cetera. and of course with my job I delved into the history of the city and in doing that I discovered like so many people have told me that Long Beach is a big city but with a small town atmosphere and that was so right the other thing I heard was that there were a lot of people back at the turn of the century who helped the city become what it has become and so I did some research on that with the help of the Historical Society and Julie. And I, their one name keep, kept popping up all the time. And the name was Adelaide Titchener. And I wondered, who is this, who is this woman, Adelaide Titchener? Uh, I read some stories saying that she was the mother of Long Beach. And I'm wondering, wow, the only Titchener I knew uh, was the Titchener Orthopedic Clinic, and 
As I looked into her history, I discovered that Adelaide Titchener was from Ohio. She was born in 1845. Um, she was a teacher. She loved children. She loved kids, and that's going to show in other things I'm going to be saying, saying about her. And she came to um, Southern California to visit someone, and lo and behold, she runs into a man named Lester Titchener, and ends up marrying him. And Mr. Titchener was in the lumber yard business, had, had some, some wealth. Unfortunately, after only seven years, he died. Uh, and uh, Adelaide was left by herself living in the San Bernardino area. But she had business interests in the city of Long Beach. And so she moved to Long Beach around 1900. Now keep in mind, Long Beach at that time was this great metropolis of 3,000 people. I mean, it was barely getting off the ground. It had just incorporated in 1897. And so Adelaide, uh, with her background as a teacher, etc., she did have some, some money. She decides she's going to do things to make Long Beach better, uh, use her money uh, that way in a philanthropic kind of way. And so one of the first things she did was to help uh, Flo Bixby build something that was called the Long Beach Day Nursery, which was created then by, uh, by Mrs. Bixby and with the help of uh, Adelaide Titchener and others, the Long Beach Day Nursery was, was created to help, guess what, little children. And this is going to pop, be popping up with Adelaide uh, uh, throughout my, my time here. Uh, she gives some money and property to, uh, to the day nursery, and now it has become, of course, one of the, the most important major places uh, in, in the city. The next thing that she did was to uh, uh, build the Ebel Club. And the Ebel Club, uh, uh, for a hundred years almost, became a, the social center of Long Beach. But more than that, uh, it, it, it was a place uh, of, of some uh, uh, advocacy kind of issues. And again, Adelaide Titchener was way ahead of her time. She supported the, the, the right of women to vote and all kinds of other issues back then in 1905, 1910, 1915, uh, when Long Beach uh, women were getting, getting the right to vote and the Ebel Club. Uh, the next thing she did was to, uh, to do something that that has had a, a lasting impact, and that was our library system. Back in those, in those days, in the early 1900s, the Long Beach library system was practically zero, and Adelaide, once again, she persuaded Andrew Carnegie, who uh, was the multimillionaire helping build libraries all over the United States, she persuaded him to bring some of his money to Long Beach, where the Carnegie Library uh, was built uh, on an ocean between Pine and Pacific. And of course, now we have the beautiful uh, Billie Jean King uh, Library, which was so fantastic. And all these things, the other thing, Marcel, about philanthropy uh, that obviously I've noticed and, and you've noticed, these places have to start somewhere. They don't just automatically grow up to be like the Billie Jean King just didn't start yesterday. And the, the start came 100 years ago with Adelaide Titchener talking to Andrew Carnegie. This a small library is built, and then you build on it, you build on it with other uh, donors. But the major achievement of Adelaide uh, was the construction uh, of the Titchener Orthopedic Hospital and School. Uh, this isn't generally known about, about uh, Adelaide Titchener, but she was born with a club foot. And she had this disability, which she basically hid most of the time, but this had a real effect on her. And one of the things she always wanted to do was to build something that would help disabled children. Uh, children with foot injuries, leg injuries, etc. Uh, so she she came up with the idea of the of the Titchener Orthopedic Clinic for Children, 
Uh, and she built this all into her will with all kinds of specifics. Unfortunately, she died in 1924 before the, the clinic could be built. But she had set all of the, uh, the rules in place, the regulations. She gave $300,000 of her own money, which today would be four to $5 million. She selected the five people who were to be on the board to get the, the clinic school built, which happened in 1926, it was open. They'll be celebrating the 100th anniversary in a couple of years. And it has become one of the foremost orthopedic clinics in, in the United States. It's a fantastic place. Over 700,000 uh, children have gone through that in the, in the, since 1926. And they built a, a beautiful Art Deco building in 1938, which is sti still the, the place that they use right now. And it's next door to the Long Beach Community Hospital. Uh, so Adelaide, she's just she's a major figure in the in the philanthropic picture of Long Beach, and one other person that I'd like to name. I, uh, there are so many, but one in particular I want to talk about because I knew him personally, and that's Dr. Malcolm Todd from Long Beach Memorial. Uh, what I like about Malcolm is he graduated from the University of Illinois, where I graduated in Champaign Urbana. Uh, I was a little bit, uh, I think, before his time. Maybe it was after. I can't remember exactly. But he did so much work uh, in medicine. He is credited with starting uh, Medicare in the United States. Uh, he was uh, uh, had a relationship with five, uh, five American presidents, from Nixon to Eisenhower to, to Kennedy, Johnson, and uh, Ronald Reagan. Uh, he was he was a miracle man, and uh, when he died, uh, his his family and others helped build the, what is now the the uh, Todd uh, Cancer Pavilion, uh, which is connected to the Long Beach Memorial. Uh, I'd like I'd like to end my part with with this that here are two people. These are only two people: Adelaide Titchener, uh, Malcolm Todd, and all all the good that they've done. And you multiply that not only by the people that Julie's going to talk about and Cheryl. Uh, it's, it's just fantastic. And, it, and it's, it's just one of the great things about, about Long Beach and the, the giving that is here. And it's not just the people with a lot of money. Uh, there are a lot of people who are donating. Uh, we got a check uh, the other day for our Send a Kid to Camp Fund. A five dollar check where the, a woman said, "I hope this this helps you." So that keeps this city going and makes it what it is. So, thank you, Marcel. Tr truly, rich charitable giving um, has has a ratio. It's whatever you can give, and it's every dollar is meaningful. Every it time is. spent is so meaningful, and and really, you know, we're here talking about uh, structures, but it's the people that that were behind it. And so, I'm so glad you are so knowledgeable about all of that history, uh, because really, it's the people behind the services and. And, um, and really what we want to accomplish today is as you're, as you're going around Long Beach, if you're on your bike, you're walking, you're driving, um, what have you, you these, some of these landmarks and iconic structures stand out at you now, now that you know a little bit more about them. Again, it's not an exhaustive list, but, but, um, but we really want you to feel the, the power of philanthropy and how much it's impact Long Beach in a positive way. Um, and so, so I'm looking in the chat and it looks like we've got a few shout outs for the day nursery and the Titchener Clinic. People really know that. And, um, and as well, you know, we, we really want to hear from you too. How are you all involved? Are you uh, on a board of directors that's serving on a local charity? Are you volunteering? Are you donating and, and thinking about those buildings that have been around for a while? And maybe once you hear from Julie and, and Cheryl, it'll give you some more ideas on what those are. Um, so Julie, um, Julie is a fabulous individual. She is the executive director of the Historical Society of Long Beach. She was their first executive director. Uh, she holds an interdisciplinary master's degree in history and women's studies and oral history from California State University, Long Beach, Go Beach. Her thesis was on an early history of women's studies at Cal State Long Beach, 1968 to 1976, and it was awarded a first place prize in Cal State Long Beach's annual research competition. She has led major research projects, programs, and exhibitions such as Coming Out in Long Beach, 
Long Beach remembers Pearl Harbor, water changes everything, and a woman's place in the spotlight. She is part of the team that developed the annual historical cemetery tour into the city's go uh, to the city's go to Halloween event, which I hope comes back this year. But I think you've got some announcements for us. So, so Julie, we can't talk about Long Beach without talking about the ranchos. Uh, and I understand this histor- the historical society um, is open opening up back as well. So, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I wouldn't be here without philanthropic support. Philanthropy is the engine that fuels the work of the Historical Society. And yes, we are open back open to the public five days a week. And at the Historical Society right now, you have the choice of a few exhibitions that you can look at. One is A Woman's Place in the Spotlight, which you can see from our Bixby Knowles facility on, from the sidewalk because we uh, mounted that facing out so that people could see it during the pandemic. And you can also come to see Water Changes Everything, which is inside the galleries. Hundreds of uh, donors, large and small, contribute annually to support our museum, historical collections, the research center, and programs every year. And we could not collect and share Long Beach history without all of this philanthropic support. We're also fortunate grant recipients from many foundations, including the Long Beach Navy Memorial Heritage Association. And I'm happy to share, again, that we are open. Another thing we did during the pandemic is we revamped our website, and there are some really great resources on our website. There are finding aids for historical collections on there, hundreds of historical images, an online version of the water exhibit, and 30 biographies of women and their lives and their work um, as part of A Woman's Place. But now, um, I'm happy to share with you our oldest historic site museums, Rancho Los Alamitos and Rancho Los Cerritos, and the philanthropy that supports them. The story of philanthropy and the ranchos is basically the story of former Bixby properties uh, that are now open, um, owned by the city and operated by foundations for the public's benefit. The generation of family members who transferred these properties to public use intended them to be educational. They envisioned these places to remind people of the history and to teach children to appreciate the work of those who created the city they live in. Owned as municipal facilities, the ranchos have been supported and enhanced by foundations, individuals, corporate donations of cash and services by family members and others. Perhaps we can think about philanthropy at the ranchos beginning with Llewellyn and Avis Bixby when they decided to rehabilitate the ranch house at Rancho Los Cerritos and live there. When Llewellyn and then Avis passed away, Bixby family members offered the 4.76 acre site that's surrounded by the Virginia Country Club to the city as a public space. The city took them up on it and purchased purchased the site um, and operated it as a historic site and library. And the Bixby family continued to support it in various ways. Or maybe we can think about philanthropy at the ranchos beginning with Florence Bixby, who you heard from, uh, heard a little bit about from Rich. Um, At Rancho Los Cerritos, she, I mean, excuse me, Rancho Los Alamitos, she threw children's parties. She and her husband, Fred H. Bixby, invited local children, including those from the Long Beach Day Nursery, to visit the ranch and play in the barnyards and with the animals. Former children have fond memories of jumping in the hay in the barn and play, um, and they described generous helpings of barbecued beef, fresh fruit, and fresh milk, and best of all, hand-churned ice cream. Fred lived at the ranch until he passed away in 1952, and Florence lived there until she passed away in 1961. In 1968, their heirs donated 7.5 acres of the site to the city. Then the surrounding ranch property was developed into upscale homes which eventually became a gated community. The city of Long Beach 
managed the two former ranchos as historic sites. In the 1950s and 60s, city policy and management didn't recognize any other historic sites in the city. In fact, they used redevelopment funds to demolish a large section of historic structures in downtown Long Beach that were eligible for the National Registry for Historic Places. But fortunately, the ranchos were being protected. At the ranchos, the city chose library clerks and, and former ranch employees to manage their resources. Eventually, the city chose an appropriate site manager in the care of, um, who is an expert in historic properties, Ellen Calamiris. At the same time, city revenues were limited by the passage of Proposition 13 and other properties competed for city funding. At the ranchos, Bixby family members continued to visit and support programs, but they began to note deferred maintenance and other issues. Historically important structures at the ranchos were um, getting older and needed um, expert care, and city management wasn't um, meeting this need. There's always a lot of confusion about Bixby family members and their companies. It was Fred Bixby's grandson, Preston Bixby Hodgkiss, who headed the company that was created to manage Fred Bixby's legacy and the Rancho Los Alamitos site. After it was donated to the city, he saw weeds in his grandmother's gardens and critters in her attic. Other family members also grew alarmed, and in 1984, they dedicated a foundation to manage Rancho Los Alamitos in a public-private partnership with the city of Long Beach. To run their new foundation, they hired an expert executive with historic property experience, Pamela Seeger. Hodgkiss's mother, Catherine, served on the board at the California Community Foundation and had worked with Seeger there. Catherine, her sisters, and all of their children contributed to enhancing the site that they remembered growing up at. In addition, they encouraged their friends, including those who served on other foundation boards or influenced corporate funding, to learn about the new programs at Rancho Los Alamitos and contribute to support them. The Rancho Los Alamitos Foundation officially took over operations at the ranch in January of 1986. In those early years, Bixby Ranch Company provided many in-kind services, such as legal, and um, accounting to the foundation. Another branch of the Bixby family, the heirs of Llewellyn and Jotham Bixby, continued to visit and support Rancho Los Cerritos on the other side of Long Beach, but they noted problems similar to those at Rancho Los Alamitos. Ellen Calamiris faced a lack of adequate funding, and in 1994, Bixby family members who remembered visiting the ranch as children, moved to establish a separate foundation to manage this site as well. Rancho Los Cerritos Foundation was founded by Barbara Blackwell, Jean Smith, and Jean Smith with substantial gifts from Frank and Margie Newell and Bill Lorbeer. And when John, Jotham Bixby's great-great-grandson, Bill Halford, was running um, was running along uh, the Bixby Land Company. He continued the company's support as well. Together, family members not only donated funds, but they encouraged their, funds, their friends to visit the site and donate as well. In 2014, Rancho Los Cerritos Foundation entered into a joint agreement with the city of Long Beach to manage the site, and they hired an experienced administrator, Allison Brucehoff, to replace Ellen Calamiris when she retired in 2016. In 2018, Pam Lee was promoted from assistant director to executive director to run Rancho Los Alamitos. During the pandemic, people found solace in the gardens and the safe outdoor spaces at the ranchos. Currently, both historic sites are open and with new and exciting activities. Both foundations were fortunate to begin their stewardship with squads of local dedicated volunteers who kept the sites open to the public for years. 
Ranchos, while city owned, receive only partial funding from the city. It is the foundations who are that are responsible for securing and sustaining um, the funds needed to advance educational programs, site restoration, and the preservation projects needed. Both need funding from philanthropists, large and small. Foundations and public and civic organizations are needed to thrive. People who enjoy educational programs and those who enjoy the atmosphere at the ranchos are also needed to support these treasured historic sites. Julie, it's really interesting because, um, you know, as I was looking at the pictures of the gardens, there, the ranchos, there's a, there's a comment on here that says the Titchener Clinic is the best kept secret. I would argue that also the ranchos are up there as well because um, if, if you've ever been to the gardens in the back, they're so beautiful. And it always reminds me when I'm there, why don't I come here more often? And, um, and I hear they've got some programming coming up this summer. So summertime is coming. The ranchos are going to be open. It's going to be a perfect time to go to the ranchos. When it's really, really hot, go to the Historical Society. I'm sure they'll have their air conditioning on. <laughs> and, uh, and Rancho Los Cerritos and the Historical Society are located uh, within a short distance of each other. So a great, great combo uh, day treat. And, and Julie, we really appreciate, you know, you're, you're a real gem in terms of your knowledge uh, of the, and, and the fact that you could share this with the community today is just very much appreciated. And uh, so, so we're going to turn to Cheryl, um, Cheryl Perry here. Cheryl moved to Long Beach in 1983 and is a current, she's the current president of two nonprofits. And I think I'm busy. You've got two, two presidential <laughs> positions. She's president of Long Beach Heritage and the Long Beach Navy Memorial Heritage Association. Long Beach Heritage is a nonprofit organization whose purpose is to educate, advocate, and promote public knowledge and preservation of significant historical and architectural resources, neighborhoods, and the cultural heritage of the city. That's a big responsibility. It is. <laughs> the Navy, uh, the Long Beach Navy Memorial Heritage Association, or we'll call it the Navy Trust, supports historic resources in Long Beach as well as honors the contributions of the Navy and architect Paul Revere Williams when it does go through um, its annual grant process, which is actually administered by the Long Beach Community Foundation. So we've got a partnership there. Um, so Cheryl, for today, we're going to dive into your work on the the, uh, the Navy Trust Board and, and the work that you do there. And, and you really make a remarkable difference on preserving community landmarks. So if you would please tell us a little bit about the Navy Trust. I will. Well, as you said, um, I came to Long Beach in 1983. Um, my husband and I were looking uh, to restore an old home. And we, we were referred to Long Beach by a friend of ours. And as Rich said, when we came to Long Beach, we were impressed with the beautiful buildings, the architecture in Long Beach and the homes in the historic districts. Um, because that, what we felt gave Long Beach its unique character. And that's what kind of what we were looking for. But at the same time, we were dismayed by the demolition of a lot of the buildings. Again, that Julie mentioned um, in the downtown area and that was still going on um, at that time. So being interested in preservation, um, I joined the local uh, historic district neighborhood association and then um, um, as Marcel said then I joined uh, Long Beach Heritage um, whose goal is to preserve and educate about the value of preserving these beautiful buildings. Um, I was appointed a number of years ago to the Long Beach Navy Memorial Heritage Association and we do call it the Navy Trust for short. That's too big a handle to, <laughs> to get out. Um, this uh, fund was established in uh, 1998 with mit mitigation monies um, as a result of the loss of the historic Roosevelt uh, Historic District on the Long Beach Navy base. The buildings that had been uh, built by the architect Paul Revere Williams um, this happened when the Navy base and the shipyard were closing. So this fund was established with four and a half million dollars to be used uh, to preserve uh, different buildings and projects within the city of Long Beach. And since uh, the fund was established, we have been able to grant over four million dollars for projects. And, um, and now we still have 
over four and a half million dollars uh, in the fund, and thanks in part to the long <coughs> to the um, uh, God, I can't even think. Um, well, I, I want to interrupt you there, if I may, just yes. for a moment, because you just said that you have a four and a half million dollar endowment. Yes. Now, for folks at home that don't know what an endowment is, it means that you have like a principal balance in a bank account and you don't spend it, which is kind of a weird concept because that's what we want to do when we have four and a half million dollars to spend it. But you invest it and it earns income, interest income, and you just spend the income. And you just said you have four and a half million dollars, but you've given away four million dollars. So that's you've cool. essentially given away what you have in the bank. And that is the power of endowments. And that's why you know, when we're talking here today about all of these structures and buildings and things that, that have been around for so long and, and gifts large and small from so many people, an endowment lives on forever. It's going to outlive all of us and it's going to be around forever to support services and buildings. So I, I really want everyone to understand the significance of that and, uh, and to really think about, you know, endowments as a good, a good positive investment. Yes, and the Long Beach Community Foundation has done a great job for us and we're very grateful um, for that. Uh, Long Beach has approximately 128 landmarked buildings plus 18 historic districts and many of these buildings are over 100 years old so maintaining them um, is often a real challenge. Uh, the Navy Trust um, is able to grant small amounts um, each year. They're usually between five and fifty thousand dollars. And since we just grant the income that we've earned um, during that year, we've been able then to maintain the funds uh, corpus. Um, and Julie mentioned about the Bixby's and, uh, and the Ranchos that we have um, been able to give a, a few grants to over the years. And another Bixby um, that uh, helped uh, with the establishment of another wonderful building in Long Beach is the First Congregational Church at 3rd and Cedar. Um, it was originally Cerritos Hall uh, that was there on that property. It was the first, I believe, public building in Long Beach. And then in 1888, Margaret Bixby and her father were instrumental in transitioning it to the First Congregational Church. The original Cerritos Hall was moved uh, a few years later and another building was built there. But then the current building that's there was built in 1914. Um, and it is um, a beautiful example of Italian Romanesque revival architecture. And I can't say enough about how wonderful the congregation there has maintain for the over the last hundred years this structure both inside and out it's truly a masterpiece um, the uh, I think it was in the 70s that there were more stringent uh, earthquake uh, codes enacted and a lot of the public buildings in Long Beach um, were faced with the challenge of either during an expensive retrofit to the building or seeing them demolished. And fortunately, the congregation um, of the First Congregational Church found a way to do the um, repairs needed and continue to maintain the church. Just recently, they completed an even more extensive uh, restoration to the tune of, I think, two to three million dollars under, <clears throat> under the guidance of um, a preservation specialist, uh, John Fiddler. He has done projects all over the world and has done an incredible job with this structure. Not just Long Beach, but cities all over the world are facing this same challenge uh, with 100 plus year old buildings, how to maintain them uh, with limited funds. Um, our country does not support um, these buildings like they do in England and some of the European countries. So these organizations re are reliant on philanthropists, um, trusts, and uh, things like that to maintain these buildings. 
<clears throat> we've uh, been able to grant uh, several grants to the First Congregational Church for some of their beautiful um, stained glass windows. And not just them, but there's several other uh, churches in the city of Long Beach that have exceptional stained glass windows as well. And a couple that uh, we were able to help was the Christian Outreach, uh, was originally the first Methodist Episcopal Church in the, was built in 1914 at 3rd and Linden. Another one is the St. John Missionary Baptist Church on East 10th. It was built in 1923 for the First Church of the Nazarene. And also um, St. Luke's at 7th and, and Atlantic received some funding uh, for the repairs of the steeple and the original slate tile roof. <clears throat> There's many, many buildings um, in Long Beach that, um, that the Navy Trust has helped. Um, a few uh, ones that I'm sure that you'll recognize uh, is one is the Long Beach Museum of Art on Ocean Boulevard. It's housed in the historic 1911 Elizabeth Milbank Anderson House. It was designated, designated as the uh, Long Beach Museum of Art in 1957 and now houses an incredible collection as well as the restaurant Claire's with its uh, delicious menu and incredible view. This uh, building was the vacation residence of Elizabeth Milbank Anderson. She was a philanthropist and an advocate for public health and women's education. In 1905, she founded the Milbank Memorial Fund, one of the first foundations funded by a woman. Another um, building that I'm sure you've seen, the Long Beach Community Hospital, uh, Rich spoke briefly about its neighbor, <laughs> Titchener Clinic. The community hospital was built in 1924 by a noted architect, Hugh Davies, and we are happy to see it open again. Uh, the Navy Trust provided grants for the preservation plan and the restoration of the original fountain and garden area in the front a number of years ago. And then there is the uh, Bembridge House at 953 North Park Circle. This was built in 1906 by the parents of Dorothy Bembridge in 1919 and was owned by the family until Dorothy's death in 1999. Dorothy was active in many philanthropic organizations in Long Beach and was instrumental in the preservation movement in the city. Probably motivated initially by <coughs> her desire to see her home saved, um, as the city was expanding the adjacent park and many of the houses on the street had already been demolished. So because of her and others, her neighborhood became the first historic district in the city of Long Beach. After her death, the property was purchased by Long Beach Heritage with the help of a, from a grant from the Navy Trust for the purpose of preserving and restoring the house and opening it, it to the public as a community cultural resource. It's operated solely by generous volunteers and supported by donations, memberships, grants, and events. I can't say enough about volunteers, and I'm sure that Julie will agree. They're the backbone of nonprofits. I know that uh, Long Beach Heritage and the Historical Society both heavily rely on the generosity of our volunteers. So when we talk about philanthropy, it's not just dollars. Though we need a lot of those too, so keep those coming in. But, um, but it's also the time and effort put in by volunteers. Um, they are incredible. So if you have some spare time and would like to come down and be a, a volunteer or docent at the Bembridge House or at the Historical Society, we welcome you with open arms. 
As I mentioned before, there's been a lot of other buildings and projects that the Navy Trust has been able to help. Um, some other ones that I, that hopefully you have seen, uh, the Dolly Varden Hotel on Atlantic. Their incredible sign, uh, a bath in every room. When that hotel was built, having a bath in every room was um, quite unique. So. Um, we certainly felt that the preservation of this sign was an important thing for the uh, for the history of Long Beach. Um, of course, the Villa Riviera is an icon in the city, and the beautiful bronze front doors um, are just incredible. The Lafayette uh, on Linden. Uh, a few years ago, they discovered this mural that was covered over. So we were able to help them restore it and move it to a place so that it's now visible by the public. The Insurance Exchange Building on Broadway uh, with its beautiful brick and terracotta uh, work and the old uh, advertising signs there on, that I think that you can see. At Cal State Long Beach, um, we helped with the restoration of sculpture and mural there that are significant because in 1965, they held the first international sculpture symposium there. And then the armillary sphere, which is at the park near the aquarium and the lighthouse, was installed by the Navy Trust to commemorate the Navy's presence in Long Beach. And there are a lot of cool photos on there of sailors and shipyard workers um, during World War II. And though the grants that we issue don't cover the full uh, amount of these projects, in fact, they rarely do, um, but they often allow the grantee to apply for other grants and donations that they might not have been able to um, without that. So Long Beach is very fortunate to have this fund um, to help uh, in the preservation of these wonderful buildings and <clears throat> uh, to preserve its heritage. And I would like to thank again uh, Long Beach Community Foundation for its help in enabling us to maintain this fund. And it's, uh, offer congratulations on your 25th anniversary. You guys are doing a marvelous job. Thank you, Cheryl. Great. It's a great presentation. It's it's really interesting to watch all of these, and and for those watching, I hope that you take the opportunity to go in and 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 take advantage and look at some of these things. And like at the the Armory Sphere, that's something. It's uh, just outside where the aquarium is and yes. all that. And you could ride your bike by there or walk by there and not even really know what it is. So take a close up uh, walk up to these these buildings. The Benbridge House is, if you haven't taken a tour, it is just stunning and it's really interesting to look at. I, I thought it was cute how they had that little library and with the ha a, a replication of yes, you know what right. was the house on top. Um, and, and you mentioned so many buildings and structures and, and I want to take a moment kind of to pull from what Rich was saying that, that there are people behind here and there's volunteers and there's donors uh, that would uh, go on for days and days and days and uh, and, and it really wouldn't be possible without all of that support and, and donations, large and small. One thing we haven't man, man, uh, mentioned yet is the, the, the staff of these organizations. And I know you talked about the museum and community hospital and, and Ron Nelson of the Long Beach Museum of Art and Matthew Faulkner from community hospital, especially the last year. Long Beach really benefits from that continuity of leadership. Having, you know, people, you know, and Julie, you where you are and Rich where you are and and really, it, it matters. You know, when people are at places for a long time and really um, beat the drum, that's what that's what moves our city. And and that's something that I hope that we're all really proud proud of. Um, we are we are at the end of our webinar. I wish we could share more with you, uh, but we're going to open it up for for Q and A now. Uh, and I do see in the chat that some folks have uh, gone in there and, and have some comments and. Um, a lot of these buildings, of course, being in, in downtown Long Beach and, um, and some throughout our city. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking in the Q&A. 
please go ahead and just any questions you want of the panelists, maybe their organizations. Uh, tell us maybe what you've learned today, something that's interesting. Maybe share something you have you didn't know before. This is a great opportunity to do that with these uh, uh, with these panelists. Would you like to add something? Could I have? A, could I ask a question of? You can uh, ask a question, Cheryl sure. and, and Julie. <laughs> well, one uh, there there's an iconic structure in Long Beach that nobody talked about today, and I'm just wondering: is it historical? And if it's historical, should it be preserved? And it's like the 800 pound grill in the room, and that's the Queen Mary. And so I'm, I'm just kind of wondering what Julie, what you think, Cheryl, what you think, Marcel, what do we do with the Queen Mary? Is it historical, Julie? Oh, it is historical. So, yes. That, I think that's the burning question. <laughs> I, um, How do you pay there, for that? You know, unfortunately, the the news about the Queen Mary is almost like not even news because I feel like it's been the same story for so, for my entire time in Long Beach mm -hmm. of uh, an entity coming in to run it and then can't quite make it successful. So it is a challenge. It, it definitely um, speaks to how hard it is to maintain historic structures exactly. and um that there really are not public funds to do this kind of work, which is why nonprofits exist, right? right? If there were public funds, there might not be a Titchener Clinic. There wouldn't be a historical society. There wouldn't be so many of the nonprofits or the need for, for philanthropy. So I think Clean Mary is a big one, and it's you know very costly. So It really is going to take the, the will of people in the community to say that this is important and, and really and really put that forward. Well, another one we didn't get a chance to talk about, um, there's a, a family foundation, the Charisse Marie Lallaire Foundation, Chris and yes. Larry, and they have been so generous um, and adding to what volunteers and donors have been working on for years. And, and one building in particular that, that you might have seen driving uh, Long Beach Boulevard and Spring there's this beautiful, very um, artistic looking building with uh, words printed all over in kind of this uh, structure and it should be up there on the screen. It's absolutely stunning design and, uh, and I, I believe Studio 111 was behind that. And that's the Children's Today um, Echo House. And I've, I've toured it and this is an organization that helps uh, children of families that are on the brink of, of homelessness or, or homeless. And it's just a, an a, Stunning, stunning uh, facility. Great. You, and great. Rich, I think you know a little bit of, about that. Do you want to share? Well, that's great. And uh, Children's Today, of course, was started by Teresa Bixby and uh, Jennifer uh, uh, Chapman Fitzgerald. Unfortunately, uh, Jennifer has passed away, but Teresa uh, certainly is a driving force uh, with keeping that going. And this is a this is a fantastic place for kids. Uh, and and that's another thing that just keeps. Uh, uh, coming through all the time, so many of these buildings, etc., organizations, nonprofits, what are they doing? And what they're doing is they're helping children, mm -hmm. and they're helping the future of uh, of our society. And so that's why it is so important. And, and Children's Today is is a fantastic place. And architecturally and everything, everybody should go take a walk and see that building. It, it is fantastic. Absolutely, and, and, and you mentioned children. We, we also, it would be worthwhile talking about the Children's Village on the campus of Long Beach Memorial Medical yes. Center. Uh, and that, um, I, I had the honor of, of touring, and it was, you know, talking about the will of a community and, and donors and volunteers, years in the making. And it's an interesting model because a lot of the services have been spread out throughout the city. So if you're a parent and you're trying to get medical services for your child you really have to go all over and it's 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 a it's a big a big to do uh, mm -hmm. but what they did is philanthropy with administration with doctors and nurses got together and designed state-of-the-art um, beautiful child-friendly building you know the, when children are ill it's a scary time for them and their siblings and their parents and this building is designed to make that experience so much better and um, of course, we hope that you don't have to go in there for services with your child. But if, if you ever have find yourself needing services, Long Beach is so, so 
so lucky um, and to have this type of building where you have one-stop shop and you can get all of it done. Everything's electronic. Uh, they greet you on every floor. It is just, it's, it's first class. And that's how we like to do it in Long Beach. So we hope that a lot of these structures, you know, like the Queen Mary, we had somebody mentioning on the chat, remember the Spruce Goose? Uh, yeah, that's another one. Spruce Goose didn't quite make it. Uh, but, it flew away. Yeah, it flew away. So, so you know, it, it's really up to you. It's really up to us, and we, we've got to make sure that we maintain our, our historic buildings so for the next generation, we know where we came from, and, and we know where we're going. This is going to uh, wrap up our webinar. I'm going to check the Q&A one more time. Uh, but I really want to thank Rich, Julie, and Cheryl for your time today. Um, it took a lot of effort to come here and, and prepare everything and for your time and expertise. And thank you to our viewers for joining us and, and taking time out of your day to really uh, watch this and, and hear about your community and invest your time. Um, and, uh, and, and thank you, Julie, for sharing the beautiful images. We know that uh, some of those can be purchased from the Historical Society. If some of you want those maybe up on your wall, um, uh, it would make some really great art to honor our city. Um, we hope to feature just a few of the charitable landmarks brought to light today. Of course, you know, have them jump out at you when you're traveling throughout the city. Um, and we hope that you've gained an appreciation for philanthropy's role in, in shaping our city. Uh, as a reminder, this presentation will be emailed to all who registered. Please share with your friends and sign up for our third and final 25th anniversary webinar. It's on August 25th, which yes, is on purpose. And it's on the future of philanthropy. So we've gone the past, present, and future. This is going to be truly exciting. Um, I can't wait to bring you these next uh, set of panelists from the next generation, because we're all wondering what will philanthropy look like um, in the next 20 years? Who's gonna serve on our boards? How will charities raise funds? It's already happening so differently. Where would charitable donations come from? Pre generations, Gen X, Z, Millennial, they're going to have a different type of wealth. They're going to have a different type of time frame and uh, and different will to, to to volunteer. Demographics are changing, um, and with it, the shape the shape of charitable giving is changing as well. I'm Marcel Epley. It's been a true honor and pleasure being your host today and connecting with you all. Thank you, panelists, again. We're wishing you all a wonderful afternoon. Thanks for joining. <laughs>